starting my topic, I wholeheartedly thank IoT Academy for inviting me to talk about uh, Indian Knowledge System. First of all, I also appreciate uh, IoT Academy for selecting such a beautiful topic, Indian Knowledge System, because right now, uh, the as per the national education policy, IKS, that is Indian Knowledge System, is being uh, added into the curriculum both at the school level, even at the higher education level. So this is a very good initiative taken up by IoT Academy. So now we will go into the topic. Yeah. So Indian knowledge system, as you can see in the title slide itself, I have shown you the scriptures. Now, what is this? India has been the center of learning since ancient times. Okay, and you know, there are inscriptions uh, written on uh, leaves, inscriptions which are written on stones, on copper, um, on various such things, you know, on uh, leaf records and our script, on all these are scriptures, they are evidence of historical origins of learning in India. So <clears throat> whatever, long time back, our uh, sages who were there, they have already uh, learned about the system and they have also written it. Everything is scripted and documented. But no, we didn't go for patenting at that time. So there was no concept of patenting and also we didn't know what is patent and we didn't go for patenting. Off late, off late, certain inventions were made and people went for patenting. And then we came to know, okay, so this discovery or this invention was made by so-and-so scientist. But long time back, uh, during our uh, civilizations, Indus Valley civilization, Harappan civilization. So we will be seeing all these things in detail during all these and much more before that also during, um, you know, the golden rule era also. At that time also many such discoveries and inventions took place. Only thing is it was not patented. Therefore, it didn't come into the knowledge of human beings. Only when it was patented and it was circulated amongst the public, then we came to know, okay, so-and-so person has discovered so-and-so. But this cataract surgery or rhinoplasty or building up of uh, ships or else uh, making perfumes, all these things are scripted in our scriptures. Right from the era of Rig Veda, most of our inventions um, or discoveries account from Rig Veda. So we're going to see all that in detail now. Um, next slide. Okay, so firstly here, firstly here, if you see Albert Einstein, what he has written, he's written, we owe a lot to the Indians who taught us how to count, without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could have been made. So, uh, though he's not an Indian, he is uh, acknowledging the work done by Indians. So, so we were... Uh, Aryabhata was the one who had invented several mathematical concepts. We are only aware of zero uh, with relation to Aryabhata, but several other mathematical concepts were put forth by Indians. So all these things account from the era of Rig Veda. All these uh, we're going to see in live. So certain examples I have show, I'll be showing you, wherein all these were documented long time back. But you know, some other person uh, made it famous. Most probably a foreigners only have made it famous. And then we came to know that only they have invented or they have discovered. But unlike that, since long time, we are the ones, our Indian tradition is so rich enough that we have everything on the earth which is existing now, was already talked about all the existing uh, inventions and discoveries long time back in our scriptures. So this is one of the uh, accountability given by Albert Einstein. Next one, ma'am. So Indian, uh, India has a rich and eternal knowledge history, which includes Jnana, Vijnana, Jivana Darshan as its guiding principles with evolution based on experience and experiments. Now, firstly, you have to know what do you mean by Jnana? Jnana means it is actually a Sanskrit term and means spiritual knowledge. Okay. Or normally what we call in day-to-day -day language, it is wisdom. So it refers to the true knowledge of self-identity. We all have a knowledge, but how we use that knowledge, in what sense we use that knowledge, that is called wisdom. So here this jhana is the wisdom. It is actually, it refers to the true knowledge of self-identity and how we, rep how we represent it outside. Okay. And next coming to vignana. Vignana means it is a consciousness. Okay, like, you know, uh, in terms of understanding, in terms of knowledge, in terms of intelligence, 
most of the time we learn everything through experience okay so that vignana means consciousness how we uh, we we face certain situations in life and when we face uh, setbacks we learn out of it so vignana is nothing but consciousness or um, you know discernment consciousness or discernment and the other word for consciousness is discernment how we come to know um, all these things by means of experience then coming to jeevan darshana jeevan darshana means it's a perspective or a viewpoint okay definitely on one topic if there are three or four people everyone will have different viewpoint so here jeevan darshana means a perspective or a viewpoint how we see eternal or philosophical truths okay actually there is always an indian way or a bharatiya way of uh, looking into things normally i don't i don't call it superstitious there is always a scientific reason behind everything that the way we look at things the way we make decisions about anything so we regain a comprehensive knowledge of our um, uh, heritage and demonstrate the indian way of doing things to the entire world okay suppose a task is given the way an indian does and a way a foreigner does there's a lot of difference and this is all because of the uh, heritage that we inculcate from our ancestors actually you know all these things as i told you before also we have to fight and win the emerging ipo intellectual or uh, indian patent office battle we have to identify uh, the application areas for immediate implementation you know for that you require deep studies in specialized areas which is leading to research and then you visualize from the new world order or from uh, indian knowledge system it's there are things which are existing we are unaware of it that's the reason uh, such academies are um, coming up with certain topics like indian knowledge system so that each and every citizen of india is should know that all the new discoveries or inventions that are being done right now in the world was already scripted long long time back by our ancestors and all we have written proofs for all these that's the reason indian knowledge system is being included both in school education as well as in higher education so that our our young children also understand the rich culture and heritage of india okay now next slide okay so as i told you we have four vedas and everything everything is scripted or documented in the vedas more specifically from the rig veda next way ma'am so as i told you here though here uh, indian knowledge system has been existing since ages but we didn't know we are always overshadowed by western ways of thinking because we were ruled by britishers for a longer period of time so we only think that whatever we are doing today is everything is being principled or doctrined by britishers but no actually there is so much in our scriptures now with the help of uh, the government inculcating indian knowledge system in our curriculum we are once again going back to our roots and trying to learn what uh, what is existing whatever new to uh, technology that is right now in the world is already having a mention of it in our scriptures a rege regeneration of ancient body of knowledge faces challenges like maintaining the genuineness quality of material and relevance of the knowledge in modern times definitely long time back if the bridges were built with uh, you know they were built with uh, logs three logs bridges were built with three logs nowadays by keeping the three logs in mind we are trying to manufacture a long iron or steel bridges okay but the concept was uh, the shape of the log and the length of the log the width of the log all these things were already scripted in our scripture all these this idea was taken up from our scriptures and now we are improvising over the material and making a discovery okay adequate availability of funds for promoting iks initiatives so as to address modern challenges and promote pride in cultural heritage intellectual growth and self confidence among students and interested people so here you no know, basically in order to um, introduce iks one is we have such private organizations one more one is the national education policy which is uh, enabling us to know about indian knowledge system because it has been included in the curriculum both at school level and also at higher education level next one ma'am now what are the challenges ahead how are we going to uh, first of all we should know what all are there we will see some examples and then we will go to the challenges 
Now, firstly, when you come, next one, ma'am. Now, firstly, when you come to the irrigation system and practices in South India. So here you see, uh, basically, uh, you can see the well here. On the right side, you can see the well. So these these are called dug wells, D-U-G, dug wells. These dug wells or uh, um, small tanks or reservoirs, these are the most ancient irrigation systems and practices. Earlier mention of irrigation, you can see it even in the, you, you, it has been mentioned in Rig Veda. This is only called, this in Rig Veda, it is called well-style irrigation well style irrigation where it is actually called kupa and avata wells if you can remember in some of our panchatantra stories also we get to know about this kupa and um, avata wells so once they are dug they are always full of water nowadays we are using this uh, rain water harvesting pit that is nothing but an improvisation over about these dug wells only so long time back about uh rainwater harvesting pits it was written in our scriptures that is in rigveda in the form of dug wells now we have given a different name called rainwater harvesting pit and we are using but the methodology is same the principle behind both is same a pit is dug wherein you are storing water okay so you know this um what you can see on the left hand side picture is the anikat constructed the grand anicut a n i c u t the grand anicut that is constructed with stone laid in clay across the kaveri river is one of the most notable ancient irrigation works which is uh, constructed during the rule of the chola uh, emperor so it's somewhere around 200 ad okay so this is so already from 200 ad itself you have a um, a structure which is laid over the kaveri river now we are improvising it so the concept is already there in our scriptures we are only improvising it and trying to give another name next one ma'am so that was one example next one if you see surgical techniques now surgical techniques you can see uh shushruta the first slide wherein you can see shushruta with his left hand he is uh, doing surgery on and you know one more important thing what you have to remember at that time there was no anesthesia so surgeries were done under live conditions. Okay, nowadays we are giving full, either a you know, long time back, we had only specific body anesthesia, that uh, part anesthesia. Nowadays, even full anesthesia, but anesthesia is existing now because we have become very delicate, unable to uh, take up pain. But long time back, without anesthesia only, surgeries were performed. And here you can see surgeries are being performed on nose, on ears, on bladder, on cataract. Um, joints all this is done 2600 years ago with the existing surgical instruments okay but the first known surgery that was performed on human body you have a mention of it in the rig veda uh, somewhere around 2372 um, bc 2372 bc the first surgery was performed and you know what was the surgery it was a prosthetic leg an artificial leg uh, attached to a queen so that you know she can walk normally and even participate in war she could also uh, she was so comfortable that she could also participate in war so the first prosthetic leg was attached to a queen and the mention of this surgery is in rigveda somewhere around 2372 uh, bc and then plastic surgery was also performed by Shushruta and you have um, basically plastic surgery after uh, Shushruta, the, it was learned by Arabs and Arabs for a longer period of time, uh, Arabs and European countries were uh, doing good with plastic surgery. But the initial mention of plastic surgery is at 6th century BC and by Shushruta. He also performed, Shishruta also performed uh, rhinoplasty, that is nose job, correction of nose. Nowadays, you can see all the celebrities going for correction of nose or nose job we call or rhinoplasty. So this is nothing but coming back from Rig Veda, where it, actually Shishruta had a uh, good understanding of the circulation system. Whenever you're doing any kind of uh, nose surgery or lip surgery or anything, you have to have... Um, conscious mind of the blood circulation means wherever you're chipping off anything or you're trying to bulge anything you have to keep in mind about the circulation of blood so shushrita at that time itself somewhere around uh, 6th century bc he had good understanding about blood circulation in the same way you can also see cataract surgery being performed by shushrita again in 6th century bc 
and at that time no there was nowadays you have computer you have some sophisticated technology to undergo cataract surgery but at that time uh, it is called as jabamukhi uh, salaka jabamukhi salaka this was the name of the uh, tool which was used to correct the cataract surgery okay it is actually a curved needle i tried a lot to get the picture of that but i couldn't find it a curved needle which is used to uh, loose the lens and push the cataract out of the field of vision to remove that cataract out of the field of vision you need a, a tool which will help in uh, detaching the lens so this jabamukhi salaka is a, a tool which helps in removing that uh, lens so that you can remove the cataract and again push back the lens in its original place so then what they used to do they used to remove that eye and then soak it in warm butter and then bandage it but it would take long time for them to recover but at that time also cataract surgery was performed okay and no um, cataract surgery unlike now which is coming from the age of 50 wasn't happening at that time it was somewhere only at the age of 80s and 85 plus then <clears throat> so from india only all these things were learned by european countries china arabs all these people learned surgeries like rhinoplasty or cataract surgery or uh, adding an artificial limb all these things were someone has a doubt kalyani has raised a hand if you have any doubt i can clear it now Mom, that may be by mistake also, Mom. Okay. Can... okay. Then apart from this removal of cataract, then you also have removal of stones from kidney. Kidney stones is a very common problem now. Gallbladder stones, kidney stones. The cholesterol when cholesterol gets accumulated, you have stones in gallbladder. When your uh, calcium gets accumulated in the body, you have stones in the kidney. So all these things were also performed by Shushruta. It was written. in uh, in a book called samhita so shushruta samhita which is called shushruta's compendium okay which describes the ancient tradition of surgery in indian medicine and it's one of the brilliant gems which is still in use in the indian medical literature even today in most of the medical libraries have this shushruta samhita wherein all the, the way he performs surgeries during that time is mentioned in detail so as i told you there was no anesthesia at that time complex operations were performed at that time without any anesthesia okay then uh, like that if you see no here if i can mention you also have uh, yoga yoga patanjali yoga which we say which started yoga is a system of exercise you know for physical and mental nourishment so patanjali uh, was a uh, guru who actually uh, he surmised this practice of yoga the so it is from him that now today we are celebrating international yoga day but where are the roots the roots are again long back into our tradition so patanjali was um, patanjali took the credit of introducing this concept of yoga into the living beings and that is being continued now so all the yogic practice of course you have different forms of yoga you also have yoga and physiotherapy and uh, right now it is gaining a lot of recognition yoga and physiotherapy is gaining a lot of recognition but yoga in modern times you have uh, uh, through yoga no you can also reduce your hypertension depression amnesia acidity all this so yoga is also one example which is coming from our uh, tradition long time back from our scriptures and which is followed up now next slide now now coming to this art of making perfume so these are all examples after the telling the examples and i can talk about the challenges now next example is of art of making uh, perfumes so we all know that you know kanauj uh, kanauj is a capital of uh, what do you call we call it as a perfume capital of india kanauj is called as a perfume capital of india and uh, <clears throat> um if you can see that place uh, attar attar is a unique ancient in india you, it it dates back to that uh, uh, royal period you know somewhere around 60000 years old back um wherein you have uh, this archaeologists they be, they they believe the art of making perfumes that actually began from this indus valley civilization 
you know you have a separate distillation apparatus what you can see in the figure is a distillation apparatus and um, which which is this distillation apparatus it is made up of terracotta it's a type of clay uh, somewhere around 3000 bc so these terracotta vessels were discovered right now also if you can see it's seen in the museums these terracotta vessels are were discovered that had uh, orifices holes okay and woven material that can be squeezed out to isolate the fragrant oils india you know long time back india was a world leader uh, in the perfume industry i guess for more than 500 years we were the world leader in the perfume industry uh, later on the arabs started taking our ideas and they started producing uh, uh, perfumes uh, a 17th or 18th century manuscript of uh, two sanskrit treatises with a marathi commentary reveals the ingredients that that is the only uh, literature that we have found mm, it reveals the ingredients and methods of preparation of perfumes from natural sources what are the natural sources from flowers you just take the flowers you crush and infuse them directly into oil or water some are to be infused in oil and some are to be infused in water see this early history of perfume uh, making you can also find it in a book called um, brihat samhita okay this is somewhere around 6th century bc and it was written by varaha mira brihat samhita a book written by varaha mira in this book you have the um art of making perfumes wherein you know the procedure the materials required to make perfumes is written so you can see this is a terracotta um setup wherein you know you can uh, the natural ingredients are put and you are trying to uh, once again so long time back no initial days it was only in oil but off late they also started with uh, water so this is a ittar handi in which you can store your uh, means you know initially it is stored like this on the right side corner how i'm showing you in the bottles it is stored but later on suppose for uh, gifting anyone this is called an ittar handi in which you can put your perfume and give but this with a wooden uh, cork is packed okay these are the natural sources the second figure is a natural sources and this is a way how people used to prepare left hand side right uh, corner one how people used to prepare perfume and how it is stored on the right hand corner it is how it is stored next one so this is also a picture of how you know these are the barrels in which perfume was stored and transferred okay these this, these are the long barrels in which perfume was stored and transferred next one okay this is a physical structure in india uh, so the first when we go to the right side one the uh, wheel now this wheel is nothing but you know this is um, ancient indian architecture which ranges from the bronze age so bronze age is around 800 uh, ce that is 800 common era or christian era so here the building materials uh, include bones um, bones also you know you have uh, rib and in bones which kind of bones you have mammoth ribs or stone metal bark bamboo all these were used to make this wheel and uh, generally it is called the sundial now here what happens no this wheel of a chariot it works as a sundial you know you also have the sundial at um, konark sun temple in india which is built around 1250 ad now the wheel of the chariot of this konark sun temple it is established in such a way that <laughs> it can tell you the time okay so there are totally eight spokes if you can count there are eight spokes in the wheel and each spoke will represent a pahar a pahar is nothing a p h a p a h a r pahar means 3 hours so each spoke will represent pahar one pahar is 3 hours so eight spokes will represent 24 hours you have eight spokes and each spoke will represent a pahar 3 hours so eight spokes will represent eight threes are 24 so 24 hours okay so the sundial has got eight major spokes that will divide 24 hours into eight equal parts which means the time between two major spoke is just 3 hours so there are eight minor spokes as well 
you have eight major spokes and eight minor spokes these minor spokes they run exactly in the middle of the major spoke that you can see it in the figure this means the minor spoke divides three hours into half so the time between a major spoke and a minor spoke is half an hour one and a half an hour or 90 minutes totally 90 minutes okay so the time between major spoke and minus minor spoke is one and a half hour or 90 minutes did you get the point so you are having eight major spokes and eight minor spokes okay and each spoke will represent one pahar one pahar is equal to three hours so eight spokes will represent 24 hours so these uh, the sundial has got eight major spokes no that will divide this 24 hours into eight equal parts which means the time between two major spoke is just three hours and as such you also have minor spokes eight minor spokes and these eight minor spokes will run exactly in the middle of the major spokes means in between two major spoke you have one minor spoke this means that minor spoke divides the three hours in half so the time between major spoke and minor spoke is 90 minutes or one and a half hour i hope you all understood that but anyways this sundial is also uh, ranging from 1250 ad which tells us the time based on the sun's light and the shadow that it forms it, it helps us to tell the time okay in the same way on the left hand side you have iron pillar what is the speciality of this it never gets rusted actually iron should get rusted because it is exposed to um, air uh, sunlight all the external conditions it is exposed to so this is an iron pillar in delhi and it was set up by raja gava in fourth century it is a structure which is uh, around seven meters uh, that is 23 feet and eight inches high with uh, 16 inches of diameter it was constructed by chandragupta chandragupta 2 somewhere around 375 to 415 ad so such a long old uh, monument it is now what is the speciality of that it is rust resistant that means it is made up of wrought iron you know what is this wrought composition of wrought iron it has high amount of phosphorus and there is complete absence of sulfur and magnesium okay so any iron will get rusted if it has got sulfur and magnesium but this kutub um, what what do you call the iron pillar of uh, delhi kutub complex which is in the kutub complex at mehruli in delhi this is a rust free iron pillar it was constructed by chandragupta too and uh, the reason that it is not getting rusted is because it is devoid of sulfur or magnesium it is made up of high amount of phosphorus so see this is all science which is which was there long time back also now also you have wrought iron and suppose that all these things were not patented at that time okay but suppose off late someone happens to read in the literature and they patent it for the first time then they take the rights long time back also when this was constructed people had the knowledge that this will never get rusted because they are they didn't uh, make use of sulfur or magnesium they only used phosphorus in that so they had an idea if they use sulfur or magnesium it will get rusted so they didn't use it that means they knew this science but it was not into any journal okay it was not into scientific publication that's why the world didn't know it was only in the scriptures but off late when someone came to know about it and when he started putting it in the research articles then he went for patent and then he started owning the right but all this dates back to our rich tradition of india that's why indian knowledge system to know how to have intense knowledge of indian knowledge system is important next slide next slide ma'am this is also more or less same about our uh, scriptures next coming to ship building so this is another example you know um, so it is about construction of ship the quality of material that we use for construction of ship and the um, the shape how, the shape how it will float so ships were there even at that time this is some this picture is somewhere from 3 millennium bc in harappan times indus valley civilization so the harappans they built the first uh, ship like this for birthing 
okay and uh, it's somewhere so this range is somewhere around 500 bc okay later on after uh, uh, the first ship that came into the first ship that was constructed was around 2500 bc but after that from 600 bc till the 19th century shipbuilding flourished in india later on it was also and this technology was also transferred to Europe. So you had uh, many people at that time, there was no airways or roadways much developed. So this uh, transportation took place through uh, sea. So all these seafaring people, they started building small boats and rafts for transportation or fishing or all such things. So this uh, idea of a vessel or something that can float on water, the concept of ship uh, ship building also dates back to our strong history, ancient history. Of course, the material with which a ship was built at that time and now with which it is built is the same. But it comes back from there. We don't have to think that some foreigner or someone has invented. So all these are already existing in our rich cultural tradition in our history it is existing so now by introducing this indian knowledge system we want our young students our children and our young friends to know that india is a land of rich culture and heritage so there's immense knowledge in our uh, traditional books we have to read them so that we get to know and might be when you improvise it you can go for a patent because at that time all the concepts which were written there were not patented now you can read that, gain some knowledge, gain some basic knowledge, improvise over it, and go for patenting. Next one, ma'am. <laughs> now coming to these guys. Now this is dyes and painting technology. So at that time, the dyes, the colors that you can see, it is all from natural. Yeah, yellow color is taken from turmeric, this red, blue, green, whatever you're seeing here, it is taken from flowers. You have flowers of different colors. So the natural sources were flowers. You were, there was also a technology of removing colors from the natural sources and using it for painting. Right now, we think that we are doing some extraordinary work by taking, by using all natural things we, uh, um, in order to beat climate change. We are into uh, usage of natural things. We think we are doing something grow, uh, great or something novel or good. But no, all these things, so see here, dyes which are coming from our natural colors was existing even in our history. We are only reliving it. Most of us don't know. That's why we are learning and reliving it and improvising it. I don't say whatever technology that was existing long time back must be in the crude form. We are trying to refine it so that we get good yield with minimum wastage. OK, so this was about dyes and painting technology. Next one, ma'am. So now here coming to science and technology. So here you can see, as we saw first, we saw in under medical science, we saw Shishrita, how he was doing cataract surgery or rhinoplasty and all that. Now here we're going to see in this slide, basically uh, what focus we have to take it take from here is that, you know, uh, the Indian system of uh, Indian mathematical system. Okay, so that is this, again, this dates back from 500 BC. We have devised a set of different symbols, numerical notations, you know, from every number from one to nine. This notation system was adopted by Arabs. Okay, and they called it as Hin numerals, H-I-N-D, Hin numerals. Centuries later, this notation system was adopted by Western world. And then they started calling, calling it as Arabic numerals. Okay, so actually it is, the birth took place in India. Okay, the birth took place in India. And from there, the Arabs have adopted it. And they started giving their names, calling it as Hin numerals or Arabic numerals. The next one is the binary numbers. Now, binary numbers, you know, it is a, um, a basic language in which computer programs are written. Okay, so it usually refers to a set of two numbers, that is 0 and 1. And the combination of uh, this is called uh, bits and bytes, right? The binary number system was first time. It was described by a Vedic scholar called Pingala, P-I-N-G-A-L-A, Pingala in his book called Chandra, Chandra Shastra. 
okay so no we are thinking computers have been developed from 1964 father of computers charles babbage after that only we came to know about the binary system which is useful for uh, all these uh, which which actually led to the growth of computer language no but long time back it was put forth by our vedic scholar pingala okay and you have uh, recorded history in the book called chanda shastra okay in the same way you also have uh, excavations at harappan sites you know and that was uh, um, made from ivory and shell one of the notable scientists of ancient india was kanad you know and uh, this kanad he has devised the atomic theory actually right now we say john dalton john dalton uh, gave the concept of atom and molecule okay more specifically atom john in our science in textbooks also we are only talking about john dalton are we talking about kanad k a n a d kanad no we are not talking but actually the root cause the concept of um this atom was given by kanad actually he instead of calling it as atom he called anu okay a n u anu that means a small indest indestructible particle okay which is very much similar to atom and he also told that this anu or atom it will exist either in the state of motion or in the state of rest this was also told by our john dalton we all know only the concept told by john dalton and we have forgotten kanad now through indian knowledge system we also come to know that there was a person called kanad who came up with all this um, atomic theories centuries before john dalton was born okay i think so the moment kanad had uh, uh, invented this concept of atomic theory uh, by then john dalton was not born but we all only know about atoms and molecules through john dalton that is our state that's why the government has taken initiative to introduce this iks system in the curriculum then in the same way you also have um, aryabhata uh, so the concept uh, of our he this aryabhata he he propounded that you no know, the earth is round and it uh, rotates on its own axis and revolves around the sun that is a heliocentric theory what we call um he, he, the predictions were made about sol uh, solar and lunar eclipses now also you no know, our uh, astrologers make this prediction of solar and lunar eclipses based on this concept duration of the day and the distance between the earth and moon all these things so all these things again if we go back it dates back to the period of aryabhata okay and then you also have um, what else all these um, Uh, left hand side whatever tools that you can see all these tools were used for surgeries long time back uh, so we don't have any sophisticated instruments now that we are using and see at that time there was no sterilization there was no anesthesia but yes so what i'm telling you that the basic concept was existing what we did we improvised over it we refined it okay with our common sense we have refined it with our what basic knowledge is taken we are improvising over it and coming forward so that we get a good outcome okay if you can see um uh, what what we call that um, i'm not getting that one we have that wood steel only we damascus sword yeah dam this damascus sword actually you know with damascus sword you can cut anything in the smallest size also why because you know the edge of the sword the edge of the sword is made up of wood steel what is the speciality of this wood steel just now we have seen in that uh, minar what i have told you in in delhi that minar which doesn't get rusted in the same way the edge of this wood steel is also made uh, edge of this damascus sword is also made of that wood steel which doesn't get rusted and it is so, and you don't have to sharpen it often so this was also told long long time back so the concept of wood steel nowadays through nanotechnology now the new concept of nanotechnology is talking about wood steel okay and damascus sword and wood steel and many things nowadays nanotechnology is talking about it but you see long time back uh it this wood steel was called siric iron siric iron or 
Hindwani, all these were the names given. And at that time also, we had this concept of not getting rusted and cutting the smallest particle as possible. Now, the new name given to us is uh, nanotechnology. Okay, so whatever existing science we have, we have improvised it and given a new terminology. Next one, ma'am, I guess that's over. Yeah. 